Good morning, everyone. I hope you've had a great week. For the past three weeks, we have worked, we've been walking through a crisis or a pandemic, you know, COVID-19, or a history of how fast toilet paper flies off the shelf. I worked retail for 12 and a half years, and I've never have seen toilet paper move that quick off the shelves. On a sadder note, you know, we've had family and friends throughout this world have been encountered with this COVID-19. My prayers go out to you guys. Now, let's turn to my my sermon. It is titled, He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. You know, some of us can say, well, what a horrible death, or what a beautiful death that Christ did for us. You know, Jesus' resurrection incidents that they were predicted by the prophet Isaiah 700 years before that happened. Our scripture reading is going to be from Isaiah 53. Isaiah predicted that the Messiah would be betrayed by friends, remain silent while accused, and be counted among criminals. Today, we're going to see him become sheep-like. As Isaiah says, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the word that you gave to Isaiah. Lord, we thank you for what you are doing in your people's lives today, Lord. Lord, I ask that you open eyes to see, open ears to hear, and Lord, I ask that you continue to change us from the inside out, Lord. Lord, use me as a vessel to speak to your people. Use this message as a hope. Use this message as a lifeline to people that need to know you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Isaiah 53 states, Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows, acquitted with deepest grief. He turned our back we turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he cared. It was our sorrows that weighed him down, and we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we can be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Yet Isaiah, writing 700 years before the birth of Jesus, predicted not only his death, but that in his death he would act in a lamb like manner. What are the odds? What are the odds that the Messiah would be a lamb? Yet it happened. All four Gospels recognized this analogy. Matthew says that they led him away to be crucified. Matthew 27, 31. Mark writes, then they led him away to be crucified. Mark 14, 20. Luke writes, has they led Jesus away, Luke 23, 26. And then John records, when Pilate gave him away, Jesus over to them to be crucified, John 19, 16. If we look at Jesus' life, he was a carpenter by trade. He spent 17 years of his life cutting wood, chiseling stone, building buildings. He was a wild bit man who, in his prime of his life, allowed a bunch of pew-sitting priests to lead him up to the Cadron Valley to place of his death. Like the shepherds were doing that very same day with the sheep that they were bringing up from Bethlehem to be sacrificed in the temple. No one could have guessed it, but the story was foreshadowed. The story of the Bible it is the story of the Lamb. Can I tell you about it this morning? Genesis 3. In the third chapter of the entire Bible, we find Adam and Eve, the first parents in the Bible. 
They were in the garden. It was perfect. They were naked and not ashamed. God had given them everything they needed with one restriction. Do not eat of the tree of knowledge of good or evil. He said, or you will surely die. Was well, Satan's help. They ate anyway. Scripture says that they looked around and realized they were naked. They sue fig, te- fig leaves together to cover themselves. Have you ever seen fig leaves? They actually have thorns on them. So just think how uncomfortable that had to be for Adam and Eve. God was in the habit of walking with them in the still evening. When they heard him coming, they panicked and hid under a bush. The scene goes from tragic to comic. Because really, how do you hide from God? You know, God goes, Adam, where are you? Adam says, well, I was naked, so I hid. Who told you you were naked? You didn't eat from the tree. I told you not to eat from, did you? This is all my paraphrase. Not At which point in, in the human blaming game, this is where it starts. Adam turns and points over there to Eve and says, well, she's the one that said it. And then Eve goes, well, the serpent's the one that said it. You talk about the blame game. We have that even in our own household. You know, with this, you know, stay at home, there's probably a lot of blame, but there's only probably X amount of people you can blame. If there's just a couple in the house, no kids, uh, who are you going to really blame? It's going to be you, they, uh, someone, I don't know. Or if you're going to have kids and then, you know, I, got, I have a family of five. You know, who's going to play the name game? There's only five of us that could blame each other, right? But this is where the blame started with Adam and Eve eating the apple. Adam points his finger at Eve. Eve points her finger at the serpent. At this very moment when they should have died, the Bible says, and the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. Genesis 3.21. God provided an animal skin to cover Adam and Eve. At this time, we're probably looking like working. How can God provide? All the way back in Genesis 3, 21. God provided for Adam and Eve to be covered with animal skin. You know, if you look at it, he actually had to kill an animal. The carcass of an animal so the skin could cover Adam and Eve. That's animal's life became the substitute for their lives. If we look a little bit further, Genesis 22. But first, let's look in Genesis 21. Abraham had a son in his own age. A son he had promised. A son he waited 25 years for. Chapter 22 opens with God saying, Abraham, Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and offer him to me as a burnt offering on Mount Moriah. Adam doesn't understand what's going on, but he trusts God so much so he actually grabs his son and he goes on a journey. It's just not a one-day journey or a two-day journey. It's a three-day journey. Abraham brings three things with him. A bundle of wood, a tinder box with fire, and a knife. He let Isaac carry the wood, but he carries the fire and the knife. He's protecting Isaac. The fire is hot, the knife sharp. He doesn't want Isaac to get hurt. Abraham builds an altar, straps his son to it. Then, right before he's able to strike Isaac, God reaches back and calls him and says, Abraham, Abraham. Then he goes, here I am, he says. Don't lay your hand on your son or do anything to harm him. For now I know that you have a really... You do have faith in me because you did not withhold even your son from me. Genesis 22, 13 says that Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in, a, in its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. At this crucial moment when a sacrifice was called for, Genesis 22, God provided a ram in place of Isaac. You know, I didn't really grow I didn't grow up on a farm. I grew up in a rural area, farms and ranches all around me. But look at this key point. For the rest of us, a ram 
as a male lamb. If we flip over to Exodus chapter 12, the children of Israel are in slavery in, of, in Egypt. God wants to free them. So he presents Pharaoh with 10 powerful visual aids, each designed to demonstrate that he is superior to God of Egypt. Chapter 12 tells the story of the 10th visual aid. The 10th plague, God is going to judge Egypt for their sins. But the Israelites have sinned too. Exodus 12, 21 through 23 states this, Then Moses called all the elders of Israel together and said to them, Go, pick out a lamb or a young goat for each of your families and slaughter the Passover animal. Drain the blood into a basin. Then take a bundle of hyssop branches and dip it into the blood. Brush the hyssop across the top of the sides of the door frame of your house and no one may go out through the door until morning. For the Lord will pass through the land to strike down the Egyptians. But when he sees the blood on top and sides of the doorframe, the Lord will pass over your home. He will not permit his death angel to enter your house and strike you down. Here's Moses. He's relied a message to all the Jewish household. They all adopt a lamb. They bring it home. They play with it. They name it. They bond with it. Love it. And on day four, the father of the household takes that back and kills it. Slits its throat for its blood. Can you just look at this scene? You know, the father, you know, I have three kids and we do have a dog. But can you imagine, here's Moses telling them to go get this lamb and on day four, take it out back and kill it? In four days, kids will, will love an animal. In one day, they will love an animal. But here's God telling Moses to tell the Israelites what to do. What's God telling you what to do today? Is God laid something on your heart? Maybe to reach out to a neighbor. Here in two weeks, we'll actually be having Easter. We might be live streaming Easter. I don't know, but God knows. God knows who you need to invite, to watch a live stream, watch something that is from a church that has a message of hope. Can you just see this played out in a house? You know, they might have said like, Dad, why are you killing this lamb? He didn't do nothing wrong. But he's following God's instruction. Exodus 12, the Israelites were spared judgment by sacrificing a lamb. Read back in verses 22 and 21 and 22, that Moses called all the elders of the Israel, uh, Israel together and said to them, go pick out a lamb or a young goat for each of you, your families and slaughter the Passover animal. Drain the blood into the basin. For the next 1400 years, on the very same day, every Israelite bought a lamb into their home and every household sacrificed a Passover lamb to cover their sins year after year after year why because they kept sinning and the lamb sacrifice was never permanent it was temporary people longed for a, a concrete evidence a concrete sacrifice one that would pay for their sins once and for all these sacrifices continued as Israel moved into the promised land and they continued after they were carried into captivity in Babylon. They continued when they returned again in their homeland. Prophets came and went. From time to time, there was further talk about lambs and sacrifices. Then one day, a prophet named Isaiah came on the scene. Isaiah spoke about a, about a servant, a suffering servant who would one day come and align the people closely with God. In his 53rd book of Isaiah says, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Isaiah said he would be led like a what? The Messiah will be led like a lamb to the slaughter. Like a lamb. People began to scratch their head. Could it really be that one day that the lamb would be a man? No one knew for sure, but it was there for now. It was in their secret texts. Centuries passed, people 
wandered, and every year a lamb was slaughtered. Until one day a carpenter from Nazareth led his building sh left his building shop and journeyed south along the Jordan River until he came to a place where a rabbi named John was baptizing. John was in the middle of the water and when he looked up and saw Jesus on the shore, pointing in his direction, John said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John 1, 29. It was an electric moment. Mothers hugged their babies, fathers cradled their sons, hair stood up, on the back of people's head. This was the man who was the lamb and he was going to lift the weight of their sin. Finally, finally, if you have ever continued to flip pages forward, we're in the New Testament, the book of John. John 1. John identifies Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. For three and a half years, Jesus was was a teacher like no other. He heals like no other. He cares like no other. Long, long story recorded in the Bible, Jesus was led up a hill called Golgotha, where he suffered like his servant and died like no other, giving his life as a payment for the sins of the world. With the last breath of oxygen in his lung, he looked around at the people gathered there thought about the people who had ever lived and all the people like you and me who would live one day. He whispered one Greek word, three words in English, is T-Talestai. Hopefully I said that right, but it says, it is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. John 19, 30. Tetelestai is a word merchants wrote on sales slip when someone paid their bill. It means paid in full. Paid in full. No more payment. They gave everything back to that merchant. Nothing more ever needs to be done to atone for the sins of the world. The author of Hebrews says, With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Hebrews 9.12 The story of the Bible is the story of the Lamb who was slain for the sins of the world. Our sins. Once for all. Forty days after his resurrection, Jesus returned to heaven to be seated in the position of power and authority at the right hand of the Father. Go all the way back in your Bible. In Revelation, you'll find this in Revelation 5.13. And then I heard every creature in heaven and earth and under the earth and, under the, and in the sea, they sing blessing and honor and glory and power. Belong to the one sitting on the throne and the Lamb forever and ever. The story of the history of our planet ends with Revelation 5. The Lamb is now in heaven, worshiping forever. But the story of our, of our, of our human being doesn't end with the ending of our planet. Jesus reigns in Revelation 5. But the story continues in Revelation 22. Revelation 21 calls the new heaven and the new earth. The new earth will be eternal city. Revelation 21, 33 says, And the city has no need of sun or moon, for the glory of God eliminates the city, and the Lamb is the light. The Lamb concludes that in Revelation 21, the Lamb will one day light the new heavens and the new earth. Jesus allowed himself to be led to the slaughter because he saw everything you needed and he determined to pay it for you. This is the lamb you can trust. Let him into your life. Let him into your heart. Let him pay for your sin. I know right now, you know, we're being isolated from human contact. Stay at home. Don't go within six feet of each other. But I'm going to let you know today. 
God is a living God. The Holy Spirit is near us. All we have to do sometimes is just turn to the right or turn to the left. And he's there. There's probably some of us that feel isolated in our own house. That we just want to have human contact. But sometimes we just need to turn. And we need to continue to seek God. And not seek humans. Or someone that can help us. There's sometimes we just need to turn our attention more towards God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you are doing in the midst of this crisis, of this pandemic of COVID-19. Lord, I ask that the Holy Spirit crash the world like a wave. A wave of healing. A wave that people are going to look to you, Lord. Lord, I ask at this time that we don't seek what we need to do at this time. We need to seek the wisdom that only comes from you. Lord, I ask that you do your will at this time, Lord. Lord, as we go and we try to figure out a new life, Lord, I ask that the Holy Spirit falls on the people watching this video, that the Holy Spirit gives each person new wisdom a new anointing that comes from you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.